everyone. Today, we are talking about the worst MFA portfolio stakes that you can make ever. But before that, if your studio habits need a kick in the butt, Art Prof has everything you need, tutorials, critiques, and as we're doing today, professional development. So Clara, can you start us off with a very juicy mistake? <laughs> Yes, and this one's more common than you think, including practice pieces. So for example, sometimes I want to practice my watercolor technique. And so I do this portrait for practice. Maybe I want to get better at gesture drawings. And so I'm doing these quick studies. These are not to be in the MFA portfolio. And I know some people think, yeah, but this is going to show my skill. Why does that not fly for MFA portfolios? In the MFA, they just skip right over skill. They assume you already have it at that point. It's really all about the ideas and what you think about your work and all that conceptual juicy stuff. So they're not really interested in these technical practice sessions. It doesn't really tell you anything about what you are thinking. People really are not going to talk to you that much about rendering and how to paint a beautiful shadow. That's not really the point of the MFA program. It's really asking you to engage critically with what you do, which doesn't happen. Here, I'm just like, oh, yeah, scapula, iliac crust, whatever. Like, I'm not really thinking that hard. <laughs> if you think about it, take these things out. They don't belong in your MFA portfolio. Here's another big one. No undergrad class assignments, a still life that somebody else set up for you in class, board model, posing in class. Th this frustrates people because it's like, well, then why did I go to undergrad if I can't include any of it for my MFA portfolio? Well, as we said before, you don't even need a BFA to get an MFA. So there is that. But... This comes back, Clara, I think, to the same thing as the previous mistake we just went over with including practice stuff. This is essentially practice. You are doing this in school to learn. It's not generally your idea, or even if it is your idea, you're given a prompt, and then you respond to that in your own way. It's still coming off of somebody else's parameters, not your own. And the MFA really wants to see what you do on your own time with your own parameters. But also, Clara, I have a question for you because what if you are a student that is just coming out of your BFA and this is all you have and you're applying to school? Don't apply right away. A lot of people ask me about, oh, I am going to be senior this year and I want to do my MFA right afterwards. And most of the time, I really, really try to talk people out of it because the time frame is too small. I mean, who has time to prepare an MFA portfolio while you're actually going to art school? It's really difficult. And the fact of the matter is, most of us do graduate just having all of these random prompt-driven assignments. So I always recommend to people, take a year, two, three years off so you don't have to rush into this because the critical thinking part, that doesn't happen overnight. Yeah, I also have to say too, now that you're talking about it, Clara, uh, a lot of those assignments that you're doing during school, they give you a pretty strict deadline, a pretty short deadline. You're never going to have anything that you've worked on for more than a semester, which is how many months? Five three. months, and three, and you're working on other projects. There are some pieces of art that you'll do outside of school that might take years to complete, to be honest. And that sort of work really shows in your portfolio when you've completed something like that. It's very impressive and shows, shows you thinking from start to finish and following through. So that's something to keep in mind when applying. I think a good rule of thumb is if something in your MFA portfolio comes from someone else's prompt or let's say it's an illustration exercise where you say oh i'm going to redesign the google doodle 
the prompt is yourself. That is the MFA portfolio. It's not somebody giving you assignments at all. And it's very hard. Lauren, why is that so difficult to do? It feels like being naked in a way. It's a sort of vulnerability there because when you're working on an assignment, you always have the assignment that is the shield in front of you. It's it's setting stuff up for you. You're not digging necessarily deep into your soul for something. You have always got this anchor. But when you're just left on your own to create your own pieces, suddenly it's all up to you and you've made all the decisions and it's all about you. It is kind of a reflection of you. That sounds very dramatic, but that is what the MFA... Uh, what do you call them? People that are looking at the portfolios, admissions people. That's what they're looking for. Lost my words. We have a question here from Neil who says, do MFA portfolios need a theme or concept that runs across multiple pieces? That is a great question. There has to be a train of thought that you're following. There have to be a couple interests that stay similar across the pieces. You don't have to create a series. Clara and I were talking about this right beforehand, but they should make sense together. I don't know, Clara, can you explain that a little further? Basically, this is the extreme of what you don't want. Don't want your portfolio to be a random patchwork quilt, one-off artworks that are totally unrelated. Let's say you have a very expressive portrait, and then you have a narrative piece, and then you have all these pieces that are these random sculptures, and some of them are game design. Like You don't want something like that. That's all over the place. But there has to be continuity. I can't look at the portfolio and feel like, what are you doing? Like, I need to understand that you have somewhat of a direction you're moving towards, that you're not just jumping around all over the place because that cohesion, I do think that's a sign of maturity as an artist. Do you think, Lauren? I agree, but I do want to specify that also we're not saying that it should all just be one medium. If you're, you're just submitting all paintings or all sculptures, it is okay to have things that are in different mediums, but the medium should make sense for the concept that you're using and the line of thought that you're using. So for instance, I am a painter. I also submitted video because that's what I was working in with my paintings with Eloise. And those are different mediums, but they, they have an aesthetic relationship and they have a content relationship. I do think for a lot of people, it's a tricky balance, but I would say if you can't sum up in a nutshell about where you are, and if I ask you what your work is about and you really don't even know where to begin, that's not a good thing. You should have some loose knowledge of what that's about. I mean, the whole reason you're going to school is to dig even deeper but you have to have something because those random portfolios, they're not going to get you into an MFA program. Right. There's me. That's in 2004. <laughs> You're so, so cute. Oh, God. So rosy so cheek. Your hair, you're, you're coming back around, Clara. Your hair is as long now as it was in that picture, probably. Almost. I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> William says, I had an art teacher who told me my unifying theme could be myself. And by doing things that were personal, my portfolio would be unified. Does this work? Well, it still has to be a curated version of yourself in some ways. So for instance, I'm interested in what geese and I also, <laughs> I also love swimming and, um, 
trying to think of other things. And I also love, I don't know, Pokemon cards. I'm not going to put all these things in my portfolio together and say that that's, they're unified because it's me. It's too disparate still. So I think that, yes, it can be about yourself. And a lot of strong portfolios do have that as a specifying factor and point of view. But you need to figure out what things within yourself are are worth expressing or digging deeper into. What I would be careful about is when you make work about yourself, it is very easy to fall into the trap of the work coming across as self-indulgent, that mm. it is not work where you are actually engaging with anything outside of yourself. For example, I really like gnomes. And if I just am like, I just love them. They're just so pretty. I, I mean, that's fun for me. It's not fun for anybody else. So you have to find a way that it's not a subject that is just for you. That's the yeah. danger of making work about yourself. Nathaniel says, is the use of technology in the creation of art during your MFA BFA program considered a negative? I've made use of laser programs and 3D modeling for sculpture. Not at all. I mean, it's got to make sense within, again, the I'm working with, but there are a lot of people and a lot of programs that will boast about their laser cutter that they have or their metal wielding stuff or their 3D printer. And I see those things get used a lot within the program. And I've also seen people submit stuff that's made out of these things, especially with 3D printer. You get some really cool stuff these days. But again, has to make sense with whatever it is that you're that you're making. This is such an important part of the portfolio. Do not mess this up, you guys. Poor photos of your artwork. This can literally make or break your application. And taking photos, it's not difficult, but it is time consuming. Yes, it's, it's just so... It's something I think I would advise everybody to keep up with as they are making the work. Just photograph it. As you complete it, don't wait till the end because then it's really stressful to try to find everything, get it all together, get it photographed, uh, get the get the lighting set up and everything. Just don't let it grow into a giant task. I'm speaking from experience right now because I have let it go and now I have to deal with it and it really, really sucks. We do review the nuts and bolts of what some of those mistakes are, but this is something a lot of people don't know about for MFA applications. So what do we mean when we say some schools require that in the photo you can see the edge of the canvas, like here? Yes, this is for painters and drawers specifically, I think, but you could apply this to sculpture too and what's around your sculpture. The... Some schools like to see the objectness of the 2D object that you're doing. Like you're never, a, a drawing or a painting is never just an image, at least within academia. It's also what's around it. It's what's on the sides. This, it, it is a stretched material, you know? So what I have found, even though it's, I think there are fewer schools rather than more schools that ask for this. I thought it was 50-50, but I do think it's less. It is easier to take a picture of the painting or drawing or whatever with the edge, the edges showing, then it, and to crop it than it is to apply that later. You can't. The, it, it looks crappy. You don't want to. You don't want to try to fake add it in. Just save yourself some time, play it safe, take it with the wall and then crop it later if you need to. Most people don't have a lot of experience photographing their art in a professional context. That's another reason you wanna do it early. So if you start to realize, oh geez, I can't figure out how to get rid of the glare and we do explain how to get rid of glare here, then you realize, oh, I gotta learn these new things or I gotta try again. I mean, I don't know anybody for whom this process is quick, regardless of the experience that you have. Yes, white wall. You, you don't want anything else that's gonna be distracting. Yeah, All right. 
this I think is a big mistake. Starting your artist statement after your portfolio is totally done. The statement is so much more important than people think it is. And yes, obviously the portfolio is, but Lauren, I just see so many people underestimate how much work it is to write a good statement. I agree with you on how important it is. It is as important as your portfolio. People read it while they look at your portfolio. It makes or breaks how people think about your work. I am going to, I've got that feeling where you're going to sneeze, but then you don't sneeze. Okay, never mind. Um, So, yes, although I disagree with you, Clara, in that I think that sometimes making, trying to do the artist statement before you do the portfolio is a bit, disruptive i think that come on be honest while you're working on something do you really know what it's all about you don't i'm not saying write the statement first but that you begin the statement you've at least thrown down a bunch of words and said "Mm, maybe this and then you go and you do some work and then you clarify and you go back because i just think people separate them too much like sometimes i'll look at a portfolio I read the statement, I'm like, this doesn't match. That's yeah. not a good thing. And so sometimes when you start the statement early, that prevents that from happening. I would clarify it more like this then. I think that's important that people are writing about their work, that they're journaling while they're making the work. I don't know about starting the statement. I, I do think you need to start your statement way earlier than you think you do because it takes so long to write. It's horrible, yeah. but... I I think that it's okay to just write in an informal way about the work and then you can pull from that later when you're closer to finishing your portfolio and pull bits from that and and start assembling your statement from that. Oh yeah, I don't think it needs to be formal at all. It's just, you have to start writing things. That's the important part. And the other thing I found is a lot of MFA applicants who I work with writing the statement early on exposes major holes in what yeah. they're doing. And so then we say, oh, wow, I, I, I really don't have a lot to say about this. <laughs> I really don't know what this is. And so the statement shows that, and then we can work on that early on because doing it at the last minute is just, to me, the biggest mistake. That's true, actually. I have to say, we're doing this MFA group in the discord right now and that's come up a lot people send their what they're thinking about they put together a statement and that has really made the work improve after they've gone over that and think about those holes so i do agree with you there that that it really makes it clear what is missing so our art school portfolios group is in our Discord and you get long nerdy critiques from Lauren and I. We have weekly voice sessions. We give people support during the week as well. And you get to work with other applicants, which to me is the biggest plus because most people have to do their portfolio by themselves. And that's really hard to do your portfolio on your own without trusted information. I don't know about you, Lauren, but I've just seen so much misinformation about MFAs online. Yeah. I mean, it's like Googling anything online. You find a lot of stuff and there's not really a prioritization to what's good and what's not good or whatever. So here you at least have a group of real-time humans that you can talk with who have been through the process. When you upload your portfolio, you upload the image and there's a section where you write about media size. And usually there's another paragraph where it says additional information. And so some people might write a sentence or something about the work, but don't do this. <laughs> Why not, Lauren? It's nobody's going to read it. It'll be annoying. <laughs> Unless you really need clarification about about or some context about where something is happening. I see it. I see descriptions used a lot more for, say, new media projects where just an image makes it a little hard to tell what's going on. Documentation can be very hard, but especially for a painting, if you have a long description, your painting's not doing what it needs to be doing. Well, that's what I hear is students will say to me, oh, well, I'll say that in the description. And I'm like, you can't rely on the prescription to bail you out when something is not clear in the artwork. And 
honestly, if I'm going through hundreds of portfolios and each portfolio has 20 images, I'm just not going to read it. And then it's a waste of your time as well. Yeah, that's true. And you don't want to waste your time. You're already spending so much time on this. <laughs> right. And I just think it's important to focus on the stuff that really matters. That text description is not going to change someone's mind about whether you get accepted or not, but your engagement in your statement will. Don't fuss about those little things because they really are not that important in the scheme of things. Artwork that is too old. Let's talk about this because I know some people are under time pressure to make the portfolio, but most schools are requiring that half of the portfolio has been made in the past year. Why do you think they do that? They want to see that you have an active practice and they want that you're very serious about what you're doing and they want to see where you are right now. People change all the time. I'm sure that you think about who you were last year and it's really not the same as who you are now. And they want to see how you are now, not how you were three years ago. So this is a really, really important one that I know gets picked up on when people submit stuff that's, say, six years old. It really does catch uh, the admissions people sort of off guard. And it's just not good practice, because the thing is, if you're in a place where you can't be actively producing work, that's not a good practice. If you're just tossing in a couple new pieces, throwing in pieces from six years ago, that is not a reflection of the practice you would want to have at the MFA level and then afterwards as a practicing artist. So let's say they don't have that rule. I don't think anything should be older than two years. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree with you. I feel really guilty and bad when I put things that are over <laughs> three years old. I think if if you're really struggling and you don't and you're finding you don't have work that is current, you can't make up a, for, a full portfolio of work within the past two years then it means that you either need to take more time and develop your portfolio more or take some time away, take some time, make schedule better, schedule some time where you can work on some things that can go in. That sounds mean All right. how hard it is. No, for <laughs> the thing is, if you want to get an MFA degree, usually the assumption is you want to work professionally to some degree. I, I mean, maybe there are people who really, really don't, but most people do if they go into an MFA. And part of it is really starting to begin that lifestyle of working as an artist. Like a lot of people in the MFA group that we're working with right now, some people have been telling me, oh my God, I don't know anything about contemporary art. And yeah. so I say to them, well, you better start because the learning of the contemporary art, you don't just learn that to get in. That should be part of your life if you're a professional artist. Yeah, I should also say too on that point, thinking about people that say like, oh, I don't have time because my job is really demanding or I need to make money to live. That's still going to be an issue when you go to school because school costs money and generally you still need to pay for your expenses. You're not going to get a scholarship. So you're still going to have that pressure of needing to create work, but it's going to be amplified because you are in classes and you've got deadlines again. So it is sort of this, uh, this is the first test to see if you can handle that level of intensity on either end in the MFA program. By the way, I'm curious who here in the chat has some experience with MFAs? Are you applying this year? Are you thinking about applying? Did you already finish your MFA? And you don't have to say anything big, just say me. Because <laughs> I love it when people jump in who we don't hear from all the time. That'd be great to see. The next thing don't use the exact same portfolio for every school. Why does this matter so much, Lauren? I mean, you could if you wanted to, but first of all, the schools, every school 
has a different portfolio requirement. Some of them ask for 10 images, some of them ask for 20. And so, and some of them ask for stuff that's all done within the past year. And some of them are like, yeah, three years, that's fine, whatever. So you'll just have to change it by nature of those very, the, the different instructions, but also every school has a different vibe or a different focus. And while you don't want to totally recreate yourself every time you apply, you kind of want to cater a little towards their their interests and just be sensible about it. Uh, Clara, what did you have to do that on your applications? Did you send different, did you have to send slides? Did you do slides? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know what we had to do? Not only did we have to do slides, but for the particular MFA application, we had to buy a carousel and put <laughs> the slides in the carousel. I had to buy 10 carousels that year. Wow. <sighs> wow. You guys have no idea how good you have it with digital photography. Oh my God. Is that expensive to buy a carousel and to buy yes. all the little... I'm really yes. glad I didn't have to do that. <laughs> it was very, very bad. But that's where, again, researching the school is very important because schools don't like to say they have a look or a certain thing, but they do. I mean, it's hard yeah. not to see that. When you look at the student work that's coming out of there, when you look at the faculty, that is absolutely the case. All right. This is a big one that I think almost every single MFA applicant I work with, this is one of the first things we talk about. So why is this a problem? Broad, vague, generic concepts. If I had a dollar for every MFA applicant who wanted to make work about humans and technology, about women's issues, about climate change or identity, there's nothing <laughs> wrong with any of these topics, but they are so big. <laughs> I definitely fell into that too. When I first applied, mine said identity. It was about identity. What identity? I don't know. <laughs> so I really had to sit down. Okay. So first of all, I think that that's everybody's doing it. But also you just slide right off yep. of it. It's it's not really, it doesn't really say anything about who y your point of view at, at all. It's, it's too big. And I think that also it can be used as an excuse for actually getting like really vulnerable with yourself and figuring out, okay, what, like what happens if you have to pick a side on something? Not even a side, but a point of view. I think that's just really you will also feel better as an artist when you when you clarify you'll feel more interested in your work and you'll feel better directed about where you want to go and what you want to do your ideas will probably come easier if you can be more specific so this is an artist well-being tip too even outside of mfa dumb i mean i've probably read thousands of statements at this point and that's going to be the same thing for people on these committees. And you just really start rolling your eyes when people say it's about humans and tech, how we interact with new media and how that technology changes my life. And it changes it like, and I just, I'm like, oh my God, no, just don't do it. Because what happens also is when you don't get specific, you end up just skimming the surface. And mm -hmm. then what you're doing doesn't have any depth to it. I mean, going and reading an article about climate change, that's not it. You have to do way more work than that. Yeah. So for instance, I know that uh, William here is bringing up a good question. How should we pick themes? What are some examples of what sort of thing a theme would be? So if you're interested in climate change, but you need to get specific, okay, well, where in climate change are you really, what got you into climate change? For me, if it was me and I was doing work about climate change, it would be about how gulling, sea gulling has changed, the, the populations of gulls within the past 20 years and how they've become more urbanized. Now think about that 
I'm not just tooting my own gull horn here, or whatever, but think about like how, <laughs> <laughs> like, does that generate questions for you versus, <laughs> versus I'm doing work about climate change. Like, like which show do you want to see? The one that's about climate change or the ones about how gulls are taking over our urban developments and leaving the seas or something like that. I just made that up that <laughs> maybe you don't want to see that. Sophia is asking as an expansion, how would you specific down from a broad sustained investigation or concept? Okay, so let's say climate change. You could say, I want to talk about the destructive nature. I mean, it's all destructive nature. So you could say, Much well, hard. let's just pick a place. Pick a, a place. place. Okay. A place. A place. So okay. I could say Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay, that's where I'm living now. Salt Lake City, Utah, this climate change is very much directed at the mountains because of the way the mountains develop water and it gets pushed down into the Great Salt Lake and the lake is drying up. And so that's just me talking about Salt Lake City. But even within that, it's like, well, do I talk about the mountains or do I talk about the Salt Lake? Like, which is the emphasis? And you then you can say, well... The archaeology, since the lake is 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 going down, all of that stuff is coming up, both the toxins, but also the ships that have sunk in it and all that. Like, there's so much there. You could go at from so many avenues. I mean, that's what's easier to do is once you start realizing the specificity, you don't have to wonder where to look. You know exactly what to look because you've targeted something very specific. Same thing related, Alexandra says, how can we avoid being so general? How do we narrow down our topic and theme? Okay, so if you don't do location, you can talk about the, the type. So let's say women's issues, which I hear a lot about, okay? So you could say, okay, well, I want it to be about women in America. A lot of women in America. <laughs> so you could say Asian American women in America, but even that's too broad, right? Yeah, then it could be, what are you talking about within that? Are you talking about the, uh, like, immigration and the differences between Asian and, uh, or maybe, like, a Chinese woman, like, a Chinese American, like, you just keep drilling down, keep drilling down. Even then, that's, like, too broad. What... What's so like, I, I see people that do a whole exposition on food, for instance, and how food is related to, to gender roles and all of this stuff. Like you could pick any, any aspect of life and hone in on that. Absolutely. Another question from Alexandra. What is the return on investment of an MFA? What are the types of career job professional opportunities after an MFA? Okay, that's another stream, but I'll just tell you in a nutshell, it does qualify you to teach at the college level, but nothing's guaranteed. It's not like you get a golden ticket to do something, Lauren. And I think a lot of people have the expectation. I got the degree, I'm all set. You're not. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. If you, the rule of thumb, we can direct you to those other streams later. We talk more in depth about this, but the rule of thumb is that if you want to get your MFA, it should probably be because you're looking for something to jolt you out of your of the rut that you're in. It's a little bit of a get out of jail free card from your regular life where you can really focus on being an artist. But that's that's it. Join our art school portfolios group. This is the type of information that you can get in the group, but it's specific to you. Lauren and I can give you guys advice all day, but until we really get in there in the trenches with you, reading your statement, giving you feedback on your particular situation, it's vastly limited what you can get from these live streams. So if you join the group, it's 30 to $40 per month and you get long, nerdy written critiques from me and Lauren. We have weekly voice sessions where you can show us your portfolio and give you a lot more information. We already have a really lively MFA group in there, and it's just been fantastic to see everybody's progress. 
Join us after this live stream. Lauren and I will be doing a stage session. That's where you have an opportunity to ask us questions on voice. You want to meet us in the post live streams stage channel. Art Prof has services. We have artist calls, personal art curriculums, artist statement editing, and portfolio critiques. Big shout out to our wonderful top Patreon supporters who have supported us many through for many, many years. We are so grateful to you for your support. Visit ourprof.org. There's tons of content on there that's not on YouTube. Use the search bar. There's a whole area about art school that you guys can dig into. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And Buddy, my dog, would like you to subscribe for more tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.